general. The book of Acts is really the birth of the church. The church as we know it, the early church is the birth of the church takes place in Acts. Now when that takes place, there's obviously God is working, God has sent the Holy Spirit, He's anointed the disciples and the apostles and many other peoples, and the Word, and God's Word, God's truth, the truth about Jesus Christ is spreading like crazy all over the country. All over the countryside, all over into the the the, the uh, parts of the un, uh, parts of the known world uh, at that time, because of uh, uh, just the power uh, of God. So there's a lot of persecution happening because remember the religious the religious leaders of that day did not believe Jesus Christ was Messiah. They did not believe that when Jesus Christ died on that cross and shed His blood and was and had His hands and His feet pounded with nails and died on that cross. They did not believe that He was the Messiah. They did not believe that He paid the price and died for your sins as Scripture spoke of. Alright? They didn't believe that. So they were really out to persecute this early church. These, 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 uh, uh, these early Christians. They wanted, to, they wanted to get rid of them. Any way they could. Kill them, whatever the case. They wanted to get rid of them. So, here we are, Acts 12. Let me read to you. This, uh, uh, it's about... It's a little, it's a little long, but you guys will be with it because it's a cool little story. Acts chapter 12. About that time, King Herod Agrippa, the same King Herod that uh, sent Jesus, began to persecute some believers in the church. He had the apostle James, John's brother, killed with the sword. When Herod saw how much this pleased the Jewish people, he also arrested Peter. This took place during the Passover celebration. Then he imprisoned him, placing him under the guard uh, of four squads of four soldiers each. So 16 guards were, were, were around Peter. Herod intended to bring Peter out for public trial after the Passover. But while Peter was in prison, the church prayed very earnestly for him. The church did what? The church prayed. Peter's miraculous escape from prison. Next section. The night before Peter was to be placed on trial, he was asleep, fastened with two chains between two soldiers. Others stood guard at the prison gate. Suddenly there was a bright light in the cell, and an angel of the Lord stood before Peter. The angel struck him on the side to awaken him and said, Quick, get up. Now the angel didn't tap him. Yo, Pete, yo, wake up. It says the angel struck him on the side. Now, I don't know what that means, but the angels wanted to get his attention right away. All right? The word struck seems a lot harder than the word tap on the shoulder or something like that. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm going with that? The angel of the Lord struck him on the side and said, Quick, get up. And the chains fell off his wrists. Then the angel told him, Get dressed, put on your sandals. And he did. Now put on your coat and follow me, the angel ordered. So Peter left the cell, followed the angel, but all the time he thought he was, it was a vision. He didn't realize it was actually happening. They passed the first and second guard post and came to the iron gate leading to the city. And this opened for them by itself. So they passed through and started walking down the street and then the angel suddenly left them. Peter finally came to his senses. It's really true, he said. The Lord had sent his angel and saved me from Herod and from what the Jewish leaders had planned to do to me. When he realized this, he went to the home of Mary, the mother of John Mark, where many were gathered for, guess what? Prayer. So he went there where many were gathered for prayer. He knocked at the door in the gate and a servant girl named Rhoda came to open it. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed that instead of opening the door, she ran back inside and told everyone, Peter is standing at the door. You're out of your mind, they said. When she insisted, they decided it must be his angel. Meanwhile, Peter continued knocking. When they finally opened the door and saw him, they were amazed. He motioned for them to quiet down and told them how the Lord had led him out of prison. Tell James and the other brothers what happened, he said, and then he went to another place. At dawn, there was a great commotion among the soldiers about what had happened to Peter. Herod Agrippa ordered a thorough search for him, and when he, could, 
when he couldn't be found, Herod interrogated the guards and sentenced them to death. Afterward, Herod left Judah to stay in Caesarea for a while. So here we got Peter. At the beginning of chapter 12, it says the church is praying for Peter. The church is praying for those apostles and those people who have been in prison. And because of the church's prayers, God heard their prayers, God sent an angel and rescued Peter from prison. And Peter goes to the very house that they're still in prayer at. Can you see how prayer really made a difference in that situation? You see how when people banded together and began to pray, when like-minded believers and followers of Christ came together and began to pray, the supernatural happened. The supernatural happened. It happened what no one ever thought could happen. It happened. No one ever thought Peter was going to get out of jail. Sixteen guards were guarding him. He had chains on his wrists, chains on his feet, and no one thought he was going to get out. He got out because people prayed. Let me read to you this one verse out of 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy, Timothy here is a really young pastor, young guy, probably 18 years old. He's uh, being mentored by Paul. Paul tells him this in chapter 2. I urge you first. I urge you, first of all, to pray for all people. Ask God to help them. Intercede on their behalf and give thanks for them. Pray this way for kings and all who are in authority so that we can live peaceful and quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity. This is good and pleases God our Savior who wants everyone to be saved and to understand the truth. For there is only one God and one mediator who can reconcile God and humanity, the man, Christ Jesus. So Paul is instructing Timothy, pray, pray for all people, pray in all circumstances, pray for all things. You see, Timothy's not this guy who, you know, goes to school, has a job, and then focuses on God every once in a while. Timothy here is called. Timothy is called to a, a lifetime of ministry, just like God has called many of you guys. And it doesn't have to be, you know, a pastor, youth pastor, some type of traditional position. All of you, God is calling to a lifetime of ministry. And whatever, uh, uh, in whatever area you're going to find yourself in, whether you work in a factory, whether you work at, a, at some type of uh, insurance agency, some type of financial agency, whatever the case is, God is calling you for a lifetime of ministry. God called Timothy. Timothy was focused 100% on God and doing what God had called him to do. And Paul's teaching him, Timothy, pray. Pray for people. Pray in all situations. Pray because prayer changes things. Genesis 18, prayer changed God's mind. Abraham changed God's mind. You see, God was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. He was going to destroy it. And Abraham changed his mind for a while. God still destroyed it, but God held off and searched and searched and searched for a reason to save it. You know, and they went through this whole thing, you know, God, if you just find like ten righteous people, will you save the city? God's like, okay, Abraham, because of you, because of your faithfulness, I'll save the city if you find ten righteous people. And he couldn't find ten righteous people. And it kept going down and down and down. And eventually, God did destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. But, Abraham changed God's mind throughout that process several times by prayer. Prayer changes God's mind. Prayer moves God's hand. Prayer is the, the connection, the alleyway, the, the, the road of communication between you and God. God will speak to you during your prayer time. Sometimes we talk a lot, and sometimes we think prayer, well, i got to continue speaking and speaking. Prayer is all about you speaking or you saying words. Sometimes prayer is about listening. Sometimes we sit in God's presence and we just listen. And we wait for God to speak. We wait for the Holy Spirit to impress on our hearts how to pray, what to pray for, who to pray for. Prayer is so essential. So essential to the Christian law. So essential to the Christian life. We have to be moved 
to pray. And we're going to practice some of that tonight.